One of the most popular questions that I get is, what tools do I need to start woodworking? So instead of typing out a novel every time someone asks, I decided to make a video so I can just send a link. Now there's really no straightforward answer to this because it depends on what kind of projects you want to make. Are you going to primarily be working with plywoods or hardwoods? Do you want to build furniture? Do you want to make cutting boards or build guitars? Or maybe all of the above. So I'll try to touch on those points along this video to show which tools are better for what sorts of projects. There are some really obvious tools that I'll just gloss over really quickly. You're going to need a drill and a sander. After already having some basic tools for like home repair stuff, the first major tool that I purchased was a miter saw. But I actually don't think that this is a necessary tool to start with at all. I'd say start with a circular saw. With just a circular saw, drills, and a sander, you can make a ton of projects. You could probably find a combo pack that has all three and you'll be golden to get started. On that note, when you're first starting out, pick a brand. It doesn't matter what brand, whatever works with your price point and your budget. The reason for that is the batteries. So all these batteries are going to be interchangeable between all the tools within the brand. So if you pick a brand to start with, you're always going to have extra batteries lying around that fit all of your tools. Yes, there are some tools that have more power and more features. A drill is a drill, a circular saw is a circular saw. Just get whatever works for your budget and your price point at that time. With just a circular saw, you can use a straight edge guide or just use a square to make precise cuts. You can even use it to make half laps so you'll get going with some basic joinery. If power tools aren't your thing and you have a ton of time on your hands, you can also use a handsaw to get started. Most people suggest jigsaws to start with, but I hate the jigsaw. All right, so you've made a few projects with your circular saw and you love woodworking. You wanna invest more and you're ready to dive deeper. What do you get? Getting a table saw was a game changer for me. Even back when I was just making furniture out of two by fours, I remember the first time that I ripped the rounded edge off of a two by four and it just like amazed me and it opened up a whole new world of possibilities for me. The second most popular question that I get is, what table saw do you use? This is the DeWalt DW745, and I'm sorry to say that they no longer make this saw. Everyone's always disappointed when I respond with that. There's nothing that I could do about that, and I apologize again. I can't suggest another model to you because I don't use any other models but this one. So this smaller contractor size has been working for me for the past five years because of the surround that I built for it. So if you're a weekend warrior, there's definitely ways to make a contractor saw work for you. But that being said, I do hope to upgrade soon to a full-size cabinet saw. With this saw, I just have to do some workarounds sometimes. Like when I'm making jigs, I have to take into account that this infeed section is pretty small. Which brings me to all the awesome things that you could do with your table saw with jigs. We've got a crosscut sled, a tapering jig, a tenoning jig, a thin ripping jig, and that's not even half of it. There's just so much that you could do on the table saw. It will change your life when you get it because of the accuracy and precision that you get when you're using it. But just be aware that these tools require maintenance. When I first started, I just wanted to build stuff. I didn't think about how much time I was going to be spending maintaining and taking care of my tools. I remember when I first got this table saw, uh, I probably spent about three hours trying to align the blade to the miter slot. And I remember it being a super frustrating experience and I almost gave up on setting up my tools properly. But now, after doing it a bunch of times, I streamlined the process and now it's just all part of the routine. Speaking of which, the height adjustment wheel on my saw has been a little hard to turn lately. So I think it's time for a tune-up. Not a pleasant sound. <laughs> Even though the saw is hooked up to dust collection, sawdust builds up in the gears of the blade height adjustment mechanism. So I'll just use a blower to blow all that dust out. And while I'm at it, I'll just clean up this entire inside of the saw. The fence has also been getting stuck a little bit, so I'll blow out all the dust that's in the rack and pinion fence as well. 
Once all the dust is cleared out, you want to lubricate all the moving parts so that they move smoothly. But you can't just use any old lubricant or oil. It's best to use a dry lube like this WD-40 Specialist Dry Lube with PTFE. This will provide long lasting protection, but it won't leave an oily residue. And that last bit is the most important part. Since it's a dry lube, meaning it will be dry to the touch, sawdust won't cling to it and it will prevent the gears from gumming up again, which means less maintenance time and more building time. So much smoother. Switching to a dry lube was a lesson that I had to learn the hard way and now this is the only lubricant that I'll use on my machines. So back to talking about those machines. You are comfortable now with the table saw. You made a few beautiful projects. What tool do you get next? I highly suggest getting a router next, specifically a trim router. I remember the first time that I used a chamfer bit on the edge of a project with a trim router and it just completely transformed the project and I was instantly hooked. So when you're looking for a trim router though, look for one that has an optional plunge base. This will give you more options and it'll be more versatile and it'll be more useful. And then once you get comfortable with this, then you can upgrade to the big beasts. With a trim router though, you are limited to a quarter inch shank router bits. So the shank is this little stem that fits into the collet of the router. So you are going to be limited to smaller bits if you're using a smaller router. Larger router means larger collet, which means larger shank, which means larger bits. On these larger routers, you can actually swap out the collets to half inch or quarter inch, so they are more versatile, but I highly recommend starting out with a trim router and then working your way up to the big guys. And if you make the right jigs like this, loose tenon jig, router edge guide, six in one trim router jig, and exact width dado jig, the possibilities are endless. If someone forced me to get rid of all my tools except for one, I would keep the router. If you're just planning on working with plywood and doing cabinets and things like that, everything that I just listed would be totally sufficient. Circular saw, table saw, router, drills and sander, obviously. But let's say you want to dive deeper into working with hardwoods. The next tool that changed the way that I work is the bandsaw. Being able to resaw wide boards was such a game changer for me. So that means that you're able to take a wide board like this and slice it along the grain, creating thin boards like this. And this just opens up so many opportunities with what I do. So before getting the bandsaw, I was able to resaw wide boards, but it took a really long time because I didn't have the right tools. I was using a combination of the table saw and a hand saw. One time I even used a reciprocating saw. Um, so it is doable without having the right tools, but having the right tools just makes it so much easier and opens up so many more opportunities like making my own veneers. I got this bandsaw pretty recently, but I've been finding it to be so versatile and so useful for all my projects that I might even venture to say that someone should get a bandsaw before a table saw if it weren't for the whole blade changing situation. <laughs> so changing a blade on a table saw takes about a minute. Changing the blade on a bandsaw could take me sometimes up to 20 minutes. And that's because you have to get the tension just right. You have to adjust all these bearings to get that all just right. It's a learning process for sure. And if I thought that it was frustrating to align a table saw blade to a miter slot, when I first started, I for sure would have given up on the bandsaw if I started with a bandsaw before a table saw. So now it's all just part of the process and I've discovered a routine that works for me. If you're interested in learning how to adjust a bandsaw, I'll link down to some excellent videos that I learned from down below. Bandsaws are great and all, especially for curved cuts. So guitar builders, a bandsaw should for sure be on your list. But no matter how well you tune up the bandsaw, it will not leave a buttery smooth finish like a table saw does. There are always going to be lines going up and down the piece from the cut. So you're going to need more tools to deal with this. 
I'll start with the simplest first, a sander. One option is to get a benchtop sander like this. This is right next to my bandsaw because this is a very usual progression for me for my builds, straight from the bandsaw to the sander. Um, this is really awesome for all those curved cuts, so guitar builders take note. Another option is to just clamp a belt sander to your bench and achieve similar results. If you want an even more refined finish than that, that's where hand planes and hand tools come into play. So you might think that a hand plane would be the simplest tool, but it's actually not at all. It takes a lot of practice to get these to do what they're intended to do. You need to sharpen them correctly, you need to set them up correctly, and you need to run them along the grain correctly. So this is definitely a learning process to get right. But once you do, it is so satisfying and the finish cannot be beat. If you want to get into hand tool woodworking and you don't know where to start, I suggest getting a spoke shave and making a spoon. That will give you the best lesson in grain direction that you can ever possibly get. A spoke shave is easy to set up, easy to use, safe to use, and really fun to use. So I let my kids use these. They're an excellent introductory tool for kids to get started woodworking or anyone who wants to get started woodworking. You can use these to clean up those curved bandsaw cuts. I use these on my guitars as well. Um, and both of these are from Woodcraft and I'll link to them down below along with a bunch of other tools that can help you get started woodworking. Back to cleaning up those bandsaw cuts. If you're going to be resawing on the bandsaw, you're going to need a way to clean up the cuts. You can either use a drum sander or a planer. A drum sander is a total luxury tool that should not be on any beginner woodworking list, but I think a planer should, especially if you want to end up saving money by buying rough lumber instead of surface lumber. But once you're here, you're down the rabbit hole and there is no going back. Before getting a planer, I was limited to S4S lumber. That means it's surfaced on four sides, which means that it's square-ish and ready to use. So once I started getting more interested in woodworking and more serious about it, I did some calculations on how much I would save by buying rough lumber instead of surface lumber, and it was a no-brainer for me to get a planer. So I bought this for myself for my 10 year wedding anniversary and it's been a game changer ever since. So besides for cleaning up the rough bandsaw lines, if you're resawing, you can use a planer in tandem with a table saw and a few jigs to mill rough lumber without a jointer. And I have a whole separate video on how to do that. So a jointer is not on my initial tool list because I've been getting by just fine without one. After purchasing a planer, I got another hard lesson, a lesson in dust collection. So before getting this, a shop vac was enough for me. I would just hook it up to each individual tool as I was using it, and it was fine. Not so much for this guy. It would fill it up in like two seconds. So this stand here was actually my attempt at building a built-in dust collection system for the planer, and it just didn't work out. There was like a garbage can over here, a hose that went down here. The dust and the chips were still everywhere, and worst of all, they got built up inside the machine. So the next tool that I purchased was a dust collection unit. So this solved the problem of the planer, but I think that dust collection is something that I should have thought about earlier on. And I wish that I had a whole dust collection unit in my shop. I am planning one soon, but I think I should have planned it earlier on in the process because dust collection is the bane of my existence. All right, we covered the large tools that you need to mill, cut, and shape wood. Now let's talk the smaller accessories. So this gets glossed over in every one of my videos, but PPE is really important. Personal protective equipment, that's glasses, mask, and hearing protection. I will link to the ones that I prefer down below along with all the other tools that I discussed in this video. After purchasing that PPE, the first woodworking specific accessory that I got was a pocket hole jig. And I thought that this was going to be the answer to all of my problems. For a while, it was, <laughs> until I attached breadboard ends to a tabletop. This is what that table looks like five years later. 
but I'm happy that I experienced that mistake firsthand because I got a hard lesson in wood movement and that's actually what prompted me to do some more research into different methods of joinery. So if you're working primarily with plywood and you do a lot of cabinets and casework, a pocket hole jig is your friend. Otherwise, there are other methods that are just as easy as pocket holes that are just more appropriate for other materials like dowel jigs. I purchased this center finding dowel jig pretty early on and I use it a ton, I still use it. And I also made this handmade one that I have plans and template available on my website if you want to make it. These are really simple and easy to use. All you need is a drill to use them. And if you're ready to move on from dowels to loose tenon joinery, those are basically just bigger, beefier, stronger dowels, you can make a loose tenoning jig. This is just used with a router, so a trim router even. So once you get comfortable with a router, it just opens up a whole new world of joinery possibilities. And I have a whole separate video on what sort of marking and measuring tools are best for making sure that all that joinery is placed in the right location. I'll link that down below if you're interested as well. Once you cut all of your joinery, you're going to need a way to hold all the pieces together while the glue dries. So clamps are high up on that initial tool list. So these clamps are 24 inches long from Harbor Freight and they're seven bucks or like maybe even less than that. I know the shorter ones are even less than that. So just get a ton of those clamps. Uh, even though I've upgraded most of my other clamps, I still use these Harbor Freight ones all the time. These squeezy clamps are also really awesome. And if you plan on gluing up a lot of panels, I highly suggest getting these cabinet master clamps. Ratchet straps are also an amazing solution for oddly shaped items or really big glue ups as well. Hand screw clamps are also really useful. I use these a ton to clamp things to my workbench or to hold pieces at my machines. I use it a lot at the drill press. Now that I mentioned drill press, this is totally not a tool that you need right when you start. You might actually find that you don't need one at all with the work that you enjoy doing, but that's just it with this list. It's very personal. It depends on what you need for the projects that you like to do. So there's a general guide, but it's really very personal. What kind of projects do you want to make? If you're going to be making pencil holders, a drill press is going to be your friend. Bandsaw boxes, a bandsaw is a must. Scroll saw signs, obviously you're going to need a scroll saw. So the way that I always determined which tool I was going to get next was to look at my upcoming projects and think what tool is going to save me time so that I can finish those projects quicker. Almost everything that I make can be done with minimal, simple tools. It would just take me way longer to complete those projects. It would take me months instead of days or weeks. So every tool purchase was a thoughtful decision on time management and efficiency. I was spending way too much time trying to resaw boards with a handsaw. So the bandsaw was the next logical tool for me to purchase. I was spending too much money on surface lumber. So a planer was my next tool to purchase. The answer for what tool you need for your projects is not going to be the same for everybody. So you have to look at your own projects and what you're making and you have to look and see where you're wasting precious time, money, and resources and see what sort of tool is going to help you save on those things. So this is basically what I tell people when they reach out to me asking me what tools they should get. So now I can just send them this link. Hopefully that's going to be helpful for them and hopefully it was helpful for you. So thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you to Woodcraft and to WD40 for sponsoring this video. I'll see you on the next one.